Hello all, welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control IIT Bombay. Um, so we are again uh, starting in front of our motivational image of this rover on Mars. And we are now well uh, into studying mathematics, uh, which will help analyze the stability of algorithms driving systems such as these. So um, without delaying any further, let me uh, first give a short recap of uh, what we were doing last time. So last time um, we had started looking at the notion of uniform stability, right? So this was the week three lecture one yeah and um he we saw sort of what is the difference between uniform stability and the notion of stability all right so essentially uniformity uh, is here with respect to the initial time yeah we then started to um, look at an example from the book of vidya sagar uh, this is a very very classical example by masera and vidya sagar's book works it out uh, why this is such a nice example is because um, A, it is a scalar system which can be easily integrated to compute the solutions, right? And B, it sort of gives us some very nice features of stability versus asymptotic stability and things like that. Yeah, so this is uh, rather nice for us. So what we had seen until last time, what we had completed until last time was the proof that uh, this system is in fact stable in the sense of Lyapunov. Okay. Now, in order to prove the stability, we had given an epsilon, computed a delta. Right. So this was the critical component. We had computed a delta. So we will continue to work with this delta even today. Right. Um, so that was what was required for us to prove stability. Right. Given an epsilon, we wanted to be able to compute a delta. Right. So uh, once we did that, we were able to conclude stability. And the next endeavor for us was to talk about uniform stability. So we started discussing it. Um, but then, you know, uh, we didn't have enough time. Uh, and of course, we were missing a few steps. All right. So today I'm going to start there. And what is it? What are we going to try to do? We are going to try to prove uniform stability. And we know from the definitions here that the only difference is the absence of dependence on T naught in delta. So we need to be able to find a common delta for all possible initial times. Yeah, that is the whole idea. Right? We need to be able to find a common delta for all possible initial times. Okay, that is what is the uniformity. So now uh, we do see that in our case, where this uh, delta, de uh, this uh, initial time dependence comes from, and that is precisely from this gamma. Yeah, everything else is in fact independent of initial time. It's only gamma which depends on the initial time. Okay, and what is this gamma? This gamma was this quantity this gamma was this quantity right here. It is just a quantity which is a function of the initial time. All right. Now, what do we need? Yeah. So let's carefully think what we need. So given any uh, T0, I can find a gamma, right? Corresponding to this particular T0, right? And then Using this gamma, I can compute the delta, right? Now, the question that arises is, what to do if I want a common delta for all possible T0, okay? Now, let's, so this is where we need to be careful. This is where we need to be careful. 
So let me, before I even try to prove for this specific case, even if, even before I try to prove anything for this specific case, let me try to give a, uh, you know, give some kind of a intuition for how to choose such a common gamma in the gen, such a common delta in the general case. All right. So let's see. So suppose I have, uh, so I'm going to make this a bit bigger. Suppose I have uh, T01 and corresponding to it, I get a delta zero. So uh, I'm going to call it a delta one. Similarly, I get a, another initial time and corresponding to it, I get a delta two. And similarly, as I go on and on, I get some delta K. Yeah, given K. And I know that this is of course some kind of an infinite series, right? Because my initial time can vary from whatever, whatever initial value says zero to infinity. Okay, so I can have all sorts of initial times. Now, what does, which delta should I choose is the question. So I have so many deltas here, right? So which ones should I choose? Which one should I choose is the question. Now let's look at the stability definition. What does it say? For all epsilon positive, there has to exist some delta such that if initial uh, condition is delta away, then my solution is epsilon away. Okay. So notice that that uh, this entire uh, I mean, although I didn't mention it, but Yeah, so but so, so what although I didn't mention it explicitly, all of these are corresponding to correspond to same epsilon. Okay. Suppose I use the same epsilon and I get different delta values. All right. Corresponding to uh, you know, so these are all different initial times, right? If I may. Okay, here notice that the subscript gives me dependence on the initial time and this quantity here shows me dependence on the epsilon. So basically all of these are for the same epsilon. I want to indicate that here. Okay. So once I have this list, the question is which one should I choose? How do I know which delta to choose? Okay, and for that we need to refer to this definition here. Okay, that I, my, if my initial conditions are within delta, then I want my state trajectories to be within epsilon. Okay. Now, usually when you have an infinite collection like these, like this, you know, uh, then the problem, uh, then, then usually what are the choices for which one I should choose? The usual choice is the largest or the smallest of this. Okay, usually the smallest or the largest of this. And because this is an infinite collection, I would say the supremum or the infimum of this, you know, sequence somehow. Yeah, I will take the supremum or the infimum of this sequence. Okay, now let's see what happens if I take the supremum. Okay, so, so say, so say delta equal to soup over k delta k. Okay, so k greater than or equal to 1. Okay, so suppose I take delta to be the supremum, then what happens? Okay, then what happens? Okay, if I take delta to be the largest possible one, and then what happens? Then, uh, um, then I am the surely, okay, suppose, I mean, I'll show you what sort of problem we landed. Yeah. So suppose, uh, delta 2 less than delta. Just suppose, I mean, see, because it's obvious that, uh, 
delta is the largest value of all of these. Therefore, there must exist some k for which delta k is less than delta. All right. So I'm just simply saying that let's say it is delta 2. Yeah, say delta 2 is less than delta. Yeah, because it is, after all, I chose the delta to be the largest one. Yeah. So obviously there are some deltas which are less than this. Yeah. Excellent. So suppose delta 2 is smaller than delta. Okay. Then what happens? So, so what I know for sure, right? If I if I choose t0 uh, 2 as my initial condition, uh, as my initial time, yeah, uh, at t0 2, what happens? I know that norm of x0 minus xc less than delta 2 implies norm of xt minus xc less than epsilon. All right. Okay. I know this. Now, what's the problem? Okay, so what is the problem? The problem is I have chosen the delta as larger than this. So the question is, the, is it true that x0 minus xc less than delta implies xt minus xc less than epsilon? What do you folks think? Yeah. So this delta here is a bigger ball than delta 2. Yeah. I'm guaranteeing that if I start in the small delta 2 ball, I remain my solutions remain in the epsilon ball. But now I'm asking that if I start in the larger ball, will I still remain within epsilon? Okay. So the answer is obviously that this is. not guaranteed this is not guaranteed okay if i start in the if at time t02 if i start in the smaller delta 2 ball i'm guaranteed to remain within the epsilon ball okay but if i start in the larger delta ball i'm not guaranteed to remain within the epsilon ball Okay. All right. So, so what? So the the choice of choose choice that we made of the largest delta k is definitely not a viable choice. It's definitely not a viable choice. So, what is the other choice available to us? Yeah. Suppose now I choose my uh, delta as the smallest one. Okay. Suppose I choose my delta as the smallest one. Then what happens? And again. Yeah. So I know that this delta is the smallest one. Now obviously I cannot say that uh, implies obviously that delta i greater than equal to delta for all i yeah because i chose the smallest value so obviously all other values have to be greater than or equal to this value okay so great so for t0 i arbitrary i what can i say i know that x0 minus xe less than delta i implies xt xc less than epsilon now does this also imply that x0 minus xc less than delta implies xt minus xc less than epsilon and the answer is a emphatic yes emphatic yes why because delta here is smaller than this so if i start in a larger ball and my solutions remain in epsilon ball it is guaranteed that if i start in a smaller ball my solutions have to remain in the epsilon ball 
Okay. All right. So the picture would go something like this. So So let me try to make these so called smaller and larger balls. Right, here you go. So this is the, say the smallest and the largest ball. I'm just trying to adjust the sets the center. Give me a moment. Right, so this is more or less the center. So what am I saying? So this, this guy, and then I have this guy, and then I have this guy right so this is of course the epsilon ball this small blue thing is the delta ball and then the small black thing sorry the small blue thing is the delta uh, i ball and the small black thing is the delta ball okay so what is evident to me that if i know that my uh solution starting in the delta i ball remain in epsilon ball yeah so if i st if my solutions that start in the uh delta i ball right remain in the epsilon ball okay then it is guaranteed that if i start in the delta i delta ball which is smaller than the delta i ball so anything inside the delta ball is also inside the delta i ball Right. So, so anything starting here also remains within the epsilon ball. All right. So, all right. So let's. This is evident, right? So this, why even without this picture, I can still claim that this implies that norm x0 minus xc is less than delta i okay excellent so what do i know so this is a valid choice of delta okay so what do i know i must choose the i must choose the smallest of the deltas possible okay so if i have a sequence of initial times and correspondingly, I get a sequence of deltas. I must choose the smallest delta to get uniformity. And, and notice that this, of course, is independent, right? I mean, it should be obvious to you that this is independent of uh, initial time because I took infimum over k, and k is what was our initial time dependence, right? k was the initial time dependence. All right, great. So that's the first thing. I need to know that in order to remove the initial time dependence, I need to choose the smallest possible delta. Okay, and that's important. Now, now let's look at our specific case. Okay, let's look at our specific case. We have epsilon over gamma em, where gamma is what depends on initial time. Okay. Gamma is what depends on initial time. Now, the idea is I need to choose this. 
I need to choose the smallest of the deltas. Okay, so what is it? Let me be careful. So what do I want to do? So I want to, let me be more formal. I want to find inf over t0. Yeah, say greater than or equal to zero, it doesn't matter. Inf over t0 greater than or equal to zero of delta t0 epsilon. Okay, all right. And this is same as, if you may, okay, I hope you agree. And because, because what was delta, the way we found it, the delta way we computed was epsilon over gamma em. And gamma is was the only quantity that was bringing in the initial time dependence. Okay. Now, if my I want my smallest delta, I would need my largest gamma, right? Because gamma is in the denominator, so it's an inverse relationship. So therefore, this makes sense. I need to find my largest gamma. So then, if I move forward, what is the largest gamma? So let's see, soup over t0 greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so let's look at the expression. Okay. So it is, I believe, uh, let's see, I'm going to copy it. Let's see if I can copy it. Right, so right, so I make it smaller. And so this is what is my soup over, right? Okay, so I need to find the supremum of this quantity. Okay. Now it should be obvious that exponential is not damaging the supremum. So this is actually then, I mean, that's fine. So I will essentially say that this is equal to exponent of the supremum over initial time of minus six sine t0 plus six t0 cosine t0 plus T zero squared. Now, can can some of you already guess where we are going with this? What is the largest possible uh, value of this quantity for arbitrary t zero? That's where we start to hit the problem. This is actually equal to infinity, or I mean, if you may, if you want to be more precise, this is tending to infinity right as t0 goes to infinity okay so last time we spoke about this in terms of increasing functions and all that was not correct let me reiterate it was not correct this function is not monotone or anything but one thing is clear about this function is that the largest value that this function can take is infinity itself yeah, this function blows up why the same argument as before this t0 square is going to dominate all of these guys it doesn't matter what happens to this. This is just between plus minus six. This is going to be between plus minus six t zero. But then this t zero square, which is a quadratic term, is definitely going to dominate all these guys. Okay, so this entire quantity goes to infinity as t zero goes to infinity. Right? So what happens to the supremum? It means that the supremum itself goes to infinity as t goes to infinity. Okay. So what happens to the delta implies delta, which is inversely proportional, goes to zero as t goes to infinity. Okay. And this is not allowed. Yeah, we need the ball to have a non-zero size, right? This this ball has to have a non-zero size. But here, what are we getting? We are getting that our delta actually goes to zero 
as t goes to infinity and this is certainly not allowed okay so therefore it is not possible to choose a delta independent of t0 in this case okay so what does it mean it means that the system we have is stable but not uniformly stable okay so now of course i mean there is an additional statement here yeah but but we will talk about this a little bit later because you have not defined asymptotic stability yet okay we have not defined asymptotic stability yet so we will talk about this at a slightly later stage okay so one of the very interesting systems is that of the van der Paul oscillator is a very very um, you know um, commonly used system to design um, pacemakers for the heart and other oscillatory dynamical systems a very very interesting system and with with dynamics uh, given by equation 1.6 and for different values of mu the behavior of this oscillator changes okay so the question is uh, you know the question is uh, what happens uh, i mean what can you say about the stability of the origin for different values of mu okay for different values of mu uh, what can you say about the stability of the origin for the van der Paul oscillator yeah of course in state space form it can be written in this way yeah in the state space format it can be written in this equation 1.7 yeah so what i want you to do is to actually uh, try this out so remember one thing you will not be able to solve this equation for solutions just like we did for this very special problem it is very difficult to actually solve this equation so i don't recommend that what i recommend is for you to make these phase plane plots like this you know plot between the x and y yeah, that is the two states x1 and x2 or x and y whatever you want to call it right and i want you to see the how the picture looks how the phase plane plot looks okay. and based on that i want you to comment whether the origin is a stable one or not okay so i would like you to look at the van der Paul oscillator just look at the phase plane plots not do any analysis not try to find delta corresponding to epsilon and so on and so forth but i want you to comment just by looking at the phase plane portrait which is the plot between x and y states yeah so this x and y states yeah uh, and comment on the stability of the origin whether it is stable uniformly stable or not okay so one of the important things to remember is that uh, if x e neither stable nor uniformly stable then it is unstable okay this is the definition of an unstable equilibrium okay, if it's neither stable nor uniformly stable then it is unstable okay all right excellent excellent so i think we saw some rather interesting concepts today so we were continuing the problem of uh, trying to comment on the stability for a very particular uh, classical system all right and we had already looked at stability and we were trying to see if we can also get uniform stability okay it turned out that it was not possible right and in order to remove the initial time dependence yeah on the delta which is what we require to prove uniform stability uh, it so turned out that uh, this was not possible because we had to choose the smallest delta and the smallest delta in this case was tending to zero which is not allowed as per our stability definitions therefore we could see that the system turned out to be stable but not uniformly stable at 
the equilibrium, right? Which was origin in this case. All right. So great. So this is where we will stop today. And let's meet again soon. Thank you.